We're going to uh, talk about some of the lost landscapes and the hidden legacy in the Northeast backwoods. And we're going to look at some sites uh, that are cairns and, and chambers, megaliths, um, and some effigies. And um, I, I uh, read the book Manitou many years ago. It was published in 1989 by James Maver and Byron Dix. And these guys did a, went a long ways towards um, proving that the natives in the Northeast did, in fact, build in stone and, in many cases, um, aligned their constructions with uh, astronomical events on the horizon. And um, they, they, they were no lightweights. Uh, Byron Dix was an uh, optical engineer, an optics engineer, and James Maver was uh, a naval architect at Woods Hole and uh, was one of the co-developers of the Alvin Submersible Submarine, and he also was involved with the uh, excavations in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean of Saturini in the late 60s uh, that was associated with uh, Atlantis. And I had bought a, a copy of Ign Ignatius Donnelly's uh, book, uh, Atlantis, and lucky, luckily enough, inside the front cover were some original articles from the 1967 New York Times article on the find. And there's a, a Maver uh, pictured um, uh, directing the excavations in the Mediterranean on uh, Saturnini. So um, these guys really had, had a lot um, to do with kind of, I, I, I would say a lot of my research is built on theirs. And the case is still trying to be made that the natives did do this. It's not, um, it, it's really not taken for granted that the Native Americans in the Northeast built, built in stone or did astronomical observation, even though it is taken for granted in almost every other part of America, Central, uh, the Southwest, the uh, certainly South American ancient cultures all had a tradition of doing this. And it's really selling the Northeast native civilization short to say that they did not. Um, so I, I started looking at sites and investigating sites uh, similar to the ones that uh, uh, Byron Dix and James Maver did in New England uh, here in the Hudson Valley and found um, what I believe to be quite a few sites that fall into the category that possibly could be Native American um, and I made a, uh, a database uh, of these sites uh, so you could sort them and filter them and look for certain uh, patterns, concentrations, distributions that help, help us understand. And these are the names of some of the sites. We're not going to be able to look at them all today. We have seven Karen sites. I think it's kind of interesting to note that the Karen sites um, fall more in the, in the mountains uh, and the um, uh, Perched rocks and standing stoles and dolmens uh, usually are on ridge tops or mountain tops, higher locations. Uh, and then we also have alignments and, and some chambers that we're going to uh, take a look at. And as I said, we can't really look at all of them because it would take too long, but kind of uh, this will be a tour of um, some of my favorite sites that I've been um, researching. We're going to start with uh, the Mink Hollow Karen Fields in Lake Hill, New York, and they are located right on the Ulster Green County line. The site consists of two separate Karen complexes, each uh, with a few dozen low circular Karens, about two meters across and one meter high, very uniform, scattered over a sloping area of upland forest just north of the headwaters of the Beaver Kill, uh, Beaver Kill Creek. And uh, we'll see a lot of these sites are associated with uh, headwaters of, of um, tributaries to major rivers and also sp um, natural spring locations. So there are Karens here in stone walls. and. Um, uh, this is a, a location of where it is in Lake Hill, right here near the Ulster Green County line in the town of Woodstock, which is my hometown. A near member named Don Rue, an elderly, very tall gentleman uh, who I met at an early New York conference, gave me a map of Minkala when he heard I had re been researching there. And this is the map he created of the Karen Fields and the, and the stone walls up there. And after several trips up into Minkala, eventually I did find everything on this map. And it was, it was quite interesting to see how it lined up with some of the things that I had done. This was an early drawing I had done of the Mink Hollow uh, Karen Field and, and one of the walls there that runs about 250 feet and then has a bend in it. And this is a cross section of this wall. Uh, you'll see pictures of it. It's straight up on one side and sloping down in, on, on the opposite side. And the land actually comes right up to the top here. Uh, so it's kind of uh, a, a little bit unusual. We're going to start looking at some of the pictures of the Karens. And you know, there's a lot of them. And, um, to some, they're just piles of stone. Uh, and to me, they're a little more interesting than that. And you, they seem to be in rows. They seem to um, be very well formed, very purposeful, uh, which is, which is um, typical of, of Karens that are built as part of a, of a um, belief system. And I think it's also um, important to mention that while these sites currently kind of fall between the cracks of archaeology and anthropology, 
Uh, they are beginning to get noticed. And um, there is a site in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. Uh, the airport there was looking to extend its runway. And at the end of the runway were some stone walls and some uh, uh, stone mounds, probably similar to this. Here's a stone wall that leads to a, a, a large boulder with a pile of uh, stones stacked upon it, perhaps a, a, a serpent or snake effigy. Uh, and the Turner's Falls site, um, you know, colonial stone walls and constructions are pretty much a dime a dozen in the Northeast. Everybody just assumes everything is that. But what made the Turner's Falls site a little bit different was that the Native American tribes themselves came forward when they saw that the site was endangered by the construction project on the runway. And they really, um, I guess, decided amongst themselves to share with the uh, people who were about to destroy the site that it was something very uh, special to them and sacred and ceremonial. And that is the first site. Uh, and because the, uh, the tribal preservation officers, I believe it was the Narragansett um, and, and um, Mashapee and the Wampanoag tribes and Doug Harris, who was one of the tribal preservation officers who brought this to the attention of the authorities and said, no, these are our constructions and we, we do uh, want them protected, uh, got them li listed and, and protected. And they are the first sites in the Northeast that are um, considered to be uh, and recognized uh, by the um, uh, federal government as a Native American lithic ceremonial sacred site in the Northeast. So that really set a precedent and in some way opened the door for looking at what these other sites might be and if they fall into the same category. Uh, so again, we're looking at a wall here that um, seems to point to a, a low spot in the, um, on the, on the uh, horizon there. And if we were to put our, our compass on that, I'm not sure if I have a compass shot of that one, but it, it is pointing towards the southeast where the winter uh, solstice sun would probably appear coming over that mountain on the shortest day of the year, December 21st. There's another view of one of the walls up there, quite tall on this side, sloping down on that side. This is actually the land that rises right up to the top of the wall. Um, quite, quite unusual. Here you can see it. And, and you, don't, you don't typically see walls like this. Here's a, a portion of the wall that's running dead north-south. And you know, looking in the, uh, in the historical records, you don't find any uh, land boundaries or, or um, sur uh, survey, surveys that show this as being a property boundary or, or part of a uh, farm homestead or something <coughs> like that. It just doesn't fall into that category. And many of these sites, through research and through the process of elimination, um, are not uh, found to be what these sites are tri uh, uh, typically attributed to, which is either uh, quarrying or agricultural activity or farm beautification. Um, so these fall into a slightly different category. The Bearsville Hollow uh, Cairns, and, and notice a lot of these uh, are located in hollows. We had uh, Mink Hollow, now we have Bearsville Hollow, we'll have uh, Lewis Hollow later. Um, and, I, and I think the geography of hollows speaks to um, a place where energy may accumulate. They're heads of valleys. They're circular. Um, in, way, in, in ways, they're almost like natural henges. And we'll talk maybe a little more about that later. So up in Bearsville, we have a, uh, a few dozen medium-sized cairns. These are a little larger than the ones in Mink Hollow. Um, again, they're, they're in the neighborhood of two meters across and a meter and a half high, although some are larger. And some, you'll see, may appear to have a turtle form. Um, and there's also a large turtle-shaped boulder in the middle of this complex, which I think is very telling. Since, of course, we know that the uh, turtle played very strongly into Native American creation myth, and, um, and, that, and that's almost universal across the US. So here's one of the Cairns there. And we did a site visit here with um, NERA at the Kingston Conference a few years ago. So some NERA folks have actually come and visited this site. I'm just going to kind of move through here so you can see what these sites look like. And towards the end, you're going to start seeing ones that look a little more like turtles. This one, you know, if this was a head and you had a paw here and a paw here, it's almost beginning to have a, a turtle aspect. Many of these sites have been dug into. You can see that they've, um, over the years, somebody has looked and you know, tried to discover its secrets or find out if there's something hidden inside it, uh, maybe a cyst or, or a chamber. Or maybe they just collapsed over, over time. Um, due to natural deterioration. But I, I tend to think, because I see this in every location, that they've been uh, sampled and picked through over time. It's a closer look of that one. So these, these uh, Bearsville Karens um, are not 
unique in having a turtle aspect. There are other Karens in other sites in Pennsylvania and, and New Hampshire, and I have a few examples at the end uh, of, of this section that show those. Now we're beginning to see, again, uh, what I believe to be a turtle aspect in the construction of these. Um, you know, a paw out front, a head uh, coming out of an, a neck under the shell. And, they, and more than just a few uh, seem to um, be built that way. And of course, over time, they shift and fall, and, and their original configurations may not be as noticeable. And in the midst of all those, there's this giant boulder, which to me, it can't look like anything other than a turtle with its shell. And these are the two other um, examples, one in Spruceton Valley and one in Killingsworth. So, uh, and these were, were contributed by other folks. And um, to me, it, it um, really makes a good case that turtle effigies are present at these sites. The Spruceton Valley Karen Field in Westkill, New York, is at, again at the head of a valley. Um, consists of uh, these are larger platforms. These are quite beautiful, um, and uh, there are also stone walls here that seem to align with um, uh, bearings on the horizon that could indicate a solstice sunrise, or a, uh, uh, a winter solstice sunrise, or a summer solstice sunset. Um, so we'll take a look at uh, where this is located at the very end of Spruceton Valley Road in Westkill. Uh, in the head of this valley. And these cairns are, are quite a bit larger. Uh, some of these are as high as 12 feet and uh, 20 feet across. Some of them have, um, have also collapsed, but also some of these um, you know, have different types of construction techniques. Some of them have, uh, interesting enough, cysts or uh, passages into the interior. And this one we can kind of head right into it. I don't know if that's reading very well, but uh, there is a, a, a place in there that you could place um, place items, offerings perhaps. There are also um, places on top of these. There's another uh, looking inside an interior space. This is an altar area that uh, sits on top of one of the um, Karens, uh, just a small kind of enclosure built for, I believe, the purpose of placing something of importance, maybe a, a votive offering, making a vow to, um, to remember somebody as a memorial. And again, we have uh, walls are almost uniformly, universally associated with Karen fields. We really don't find Karen fields without walls. Um, I believe they are delineating it at, uh, the area as a, as a uh, precinct, perhaps a sacred precinct, because they seem to enclose the Karens. And in some cases, you'll find one or two Karens outside the walls, uh, but in most cases, they, they enclose them. Um, just uh, more pictures of the walls, uh, some large stack boulders at the end of one of the walls, uh, acting as a gate. We're going to move on to looking at some uh, uh, large boulders that could fall in the category of dolmen. Um, is that spelled right? Is that A or E? It's supposed to be E, I think. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so uh, these could fall in the category of balanced rocks. The, the first one we're going to look at is located on, uh, these are both, or this is located on a ridge line about a half a mile north of Bontecue Crag. Um, it's, ba it's perched on three large base boulders at quite an unusual angle. Uh, I estimate it to be about 20 tons. Um, and of course, uh, when, I, when I gave a talk at an archaeological association, somebody stood up and uh, quickly said, well, how do you think people moved a 20-ton stone? That couldn't have happened. And of course, uh, we know that people have been moving stones much larger than that for many thousands of years. So it's not, certainly not out of man's capability in prehistoric times to have moved stones like that if it was their desire to do so. Here's a closer look at this stone. And notice there's pretty much a straight line across there are aspects here. This is a west point. This is a north point. This is a uh, east point. And if we uh, put the compass right on the north point, it lines right up with magnetic north uh, on the west point. Excuse me, that's north point again, right on the nose of the rock. This is the south point of that boulder. And this is the west uh, face. 
more of a face on this side, but it does have a, a nose uh, slightly uh, protruding, and, and um, the compass on that is pointing towards the west. Here's a hand diagram, a little uh, drawing I did of what it looks like uh, where it's sitting on the ridge top. And from that ridge and from where that boulder is, you can see this view to the west, to the northwest, um, and these are the Catskill Mountains. And sitting, this is Slide Mountain, which is the tallest of the Catskills, and Peekamoose, and sitting on a, a uh, ridge line over there is, is this boulder, the uh, Peekamoose, uh, what I call perched rock. It's officially known in the DEC maps as the reconnoiter rock, and it is also located on a shoulder um, or ridge top. To me, it has a, a bit of an avian or bird-like aspect from this profile. It sits on the ground uh, on about 12 to 18 inches. And uh, you know, it's almost as if 20 big guys could get their hands on this, they could probably spin it. Now, this sun shade line, again, this could be called a compass rock because it, it really has um, aspects that align with the cardinal directions quite nicely. Uh, the sun shade line at this particular day um, fell right on the north point of the, of the stone, made it very distinct. So when I stuck the compass there, it just lined up perfectly. And um, here is, a, uh, again, a, a line dry diagram showing the uh, north-south axis and the uh, east-west and the trail hiking up. It's about a, a four-mile hike to get up to this. And um, here is the North Shuangang Dolmen. Here is the Picamoose Perched Rock. They're about 18 miles apart. Um, if we uh, align them with software, we see it's 117.6 degrees, <coughs> excuse me, 317 degrees, I believe is what it says, just under 318. Now, this is located um, about 42 degrees north latitude. And at that um, latitude, the difference between uh, the dec declination between true and magnetic north is about 14 and a quarter degrees. So if we were to... Um, so this is about 318 degrees magnetic would be a uh, winter solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset alignment at 42 degrees north latitude where this is located. So if you were standing here on the uh, shortest day of the year and you were looking in this direction just before sunrise and say somebody had a fire burning here, you would clearly see it because there is line of sight. Um, this is the profile that shows there is line of sight. Um, so uh, from, from either location, and, and this is the reciprocal, this is uh, 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 just, to, just to be clear here, because I, I don't want to misstate myself. Um, from the northwest looking to the southeast, it would be about 123 degrees true, 138 degrees magnetic for a winter solstice sunrise alignment. For a summer solstice sunset, it would be about uh, um, 318 degrees. Uh, to the northwest. And both those alignments um, exist at, at this location. So we have to ask the question, is this evidence of a group or a culture that passed through or inhabited this region and used the landscape to establish and create and preserve astronomic alignments or calendar sites based on what they observed in the sky? And I think in this case, Maver and Dix might argue that there was. Um, so I'm just going to kind of uh, look at, at um, What's interesting also to note is if you continue this alignment, it comes to the Frost Valley petroglyph site, exactly, which is where three um, uh, inscriptions were found that are considered to be one of the earliest maps of the region. And it, I don't have a map of it, but if you just continued this line all the way, it would go up uh, to the Kennesaw Peninsula in, in uh, Michigan, uh, Copper Country, and actually intersect with a tiny little island called Manitou Island, which I thought was uh, quite coincidental and, and, and fascinating. So. Um, the Shuangang Picamoose alignment, it runs parallel. It's a solstice, again, a, w a winter solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset alignment. And it runs parallel to other alignments that have, that have been discovered, uh, one of them being the Hamanasset line, which runs from burial grounds on Long Island, which have been documented, up all the way through Connecticut, crosses uh, into New York State across the Hudson River, and up precisely to a large monolith, megalith, in um, uh, Green County called Devil's Tombstone, uh, which is quite a, quite a um, famous landmark up there uh, in Stony Clove between the towns of Phoenicia and Hunter, New York. Um, so all along this, researchers uh, have been finding stone uh, cairns and stone constructions and documenting them uh, as, as um, existing right on this, this line. Um, 
Tom Paul, uh, one of the NERA researchers, uh, really brought this to my attention and published on it in the NERA, uh, in NERA. And um, uh, he and I and other researchers have really begun to start documenting all along this line. Uh, Tom Paul in Connecticut and myself in New York, uh, constructions that do fall with, uh, within it. But it's not the only alignment. And of course, we know that people have been constructing to winter solstice and uh, solstice sunrise and sunset alignments for uh, thousands of years. The, um, and Anastasia, the ancestral Hopi, used the sunset and sunrise uh, solstices to um, track their migrations over many generations as they had to change their um, villages. They simply moved them along this line. And also, if you're familiar with New York City, oh, by the way, Gary, Gary David uh, does a good job in his book, um, Star Cities of the Southwest, documenting this. And David Overson, in his book, uh, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation Capital, also documented very nicely that there are solstice alignments that were originally intended to exist, um, as well as uh, equinox alignments. Of course, many of them uh, were never realized or uh, have been now non-functioning because they're blocked by um, modern constructions. But the original intent, uh, uh, as documented in, in Dave's book, is that there were alignments to the solstice that were supposed to be um, incorporated into the, um, into the city plan. We're going to now look at uh, the Kingston Megalith site. And this is located just north of um, the uh, mouth of the Rondout Creek, right on the Hudson River. It is an extensive archaeological site. The New York State Museum uh, has records of excavations that have been done here. Burials have been found here. It's a, uh, uh, a uh, signif significant uh, chert quarry. Uh, for for 10,000 years, this quarry was exploited by um, Native Americans who occupied the area. So that's from their first arrival, basically right up through contact. There was continual habitation uh, at the site. And it, it probably because of its location, right on the Hudson River, right at the mouth of this major creek, um, it, 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 you know, it's just, it, it was a population center. I, I, I'm a little reluctant to call it a city, but when you have a place that was continually inhabited for 10,000 years by a population, and it may have been many cultures over periods of time, because we have um, early archaic right up through uh, contact, pre-contact artifacts located at this site. And what we also have located there are these, these standing stones or megaliths. And when this site was first identified during a construction project, um, this was noted and considered to be a rock shelter. So in the archaeological survey, uh, this was noted and it was protected. But I take exception with whether it is a, um, a rock shelter. There are three stones there that are standing, each about six feet tall, um, each in a circle. I'm showing you each stone here separately. And within the middle of them is, a, is a, uh, a, another stone, a fourth stone that's standing up here. It's a little difficult to see, kind of like a finger right in the middle here. Um, my friend Dave Holden, he investigated the site with me. This site was brought to our attention by a couple of arborists with the New York State Old Forest Growth Association, and it, it, the site sits on the last uh, piece of, um, of, of uh, old growth forest in the city of Kingston. And this is probably one of those old growth trees that Dave's standing next to. If we look east across the Hudson River, we see a notch in the hill due east. So again, on the equinox, you would have the sun coming up right over there on that hilltop, as seen from this site. This is the, uh, the finger that sits in the middle. If you uh, align that finger with the megalith behind it, it's a 318-degree um, a, a uh, angle bearing, which would indicate, a, again, a solstice um, sunrise sunset angle. Here's a drawing I did of it. Now, when I sent a, a uh, I should have sent this drawing, but I sent photographs of this to Bill, uh, to William Kelly, who's the uh, New York State uh, geologist. And he looked at the pictures and said he didn't see anything here that he didn't think could have occurred naturally. Uh, but when, when, when you look at this and, and you know, what's uh, going on up there, I think it's, a, you know, it's just not haphazard enough. It's a little too purposeful for it to be anything other than created by, by humans, I believe. We're going to look at a chamber now. Um, we call it the Hidden Valley Chamber. It's one of the only chambers located west of the Hudson. It, again, it's in Ulster County in the town of Rosendale, um, it, it near uh, the third lake of uh, what are called the Benny Water Lakes. And you can see them here. And, and um, you have the throughway in the Hudson. And this is the location and these, these lakes. Um, 
And you almost have to picture this area without any roads, without anything to understand the site completely. Uh, it's a beautiful chamber. It's got a, uh, a lintel stone that's uh, cracked there. Um, it's got a corbelled roof that's collapsed in on itself. And when I started doing some research, I found a picture of a lime kiln in Scotland from the 19th century that did look similar. Now, when I visited this site, I had Anne Gil Gilchrist with me, and she was the ta uh, town historian for Rosendale, and she dismissed this as being a kiln. Rosendale is very uh, well known for its cement. It was a cement industry town. Rosendale cement is quite well known. Um, and there are kilns all over Rosendale, and none of them resemble this. So she was very familiar with the, uh, the history of, of um, limestone kilns uh, and, and did not believe that, that the one that we uh, located uh, in, her, in her town was part of that um, industry. And of course, limestone was used once uh, farmers realized that you could bake limestone and break it up and use it as a buffer to reduce acidity in soil. That was done pretty regularly. But she, uh, again, and the town historian knew of no early Scottish immigrants to the town and really said that this looked pre-colonial and she believed that um, uh, at the time that it was built, kiln technology had evolved uh, much further. Now comparing it to one of the Putnam chambers, um, it does have some similarities. That I think they both have an eye aspect to them, and, and many, many times these have called, been called eye chambers. Um, and the ones in Putnam we know very well do have the, uh, the winter solstice sunrise alignments, and this is an example of one that I visited um, last uh, winter, and we took some pictures as the sun was coming up at sunrise, and we got the light dagger effect coming right into the, uh, into the entrance and on being projected onto the back wall. Um, so there was a lot of research done um, on the Putnam Chambers. Uh, John Burke was mentioned earlier uh, in his book, Seed of Stone, uh, Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. Sometimes I get those mixed up. And uh, he, he uh, and other researchers, researchers have documented magnetic anomalies at this site. Um, as you had mentioned, this is a fantastic book. I, I recommend anyone who hasn't read it should pick it up because it really opens the door to a lot of John's research. And we really uh, we lost him too early because he he really um, showed how these sites had a practical use, and he he showed how seeds left at sites that have uh, a, a magnetic anomalies associated with them. And basically, that's a a spike in the Earth's own uh, natural electromagnetic field at this location due to ge geology, due to the makeup of the ground. Um, so he discovered that by leaving seeds in an area of, uh, that had a high uh, concentration of EM, electromagnetic uh, properties, uh, resulted in more robust uh, crop yields than the controlled seeds that were left in the lab and not exposed to the, the higher electromagnetic properties. So I found that very fascinating. And here's another. Um, uh, magnetic anomaly associated with a, a stone chamber in Kent's Cliffs, New York. And uh, another thing that John Burke, and, and probably his biggest contribution, um, was that he was the one who showed that the, the uh, many of the megalithic sites in the Northwest megalithic culture have their stones aligned with their magnetic polarities all in the same direction. And this is very mysterious. How anybody would have determined way back then what the magnetic polarity of a huge megalith was is kind of beyond me. Uh, but when you line them all up, and this is the uh, Avebury circle here, um, and this is the CERN collider, the hu uh, large Halderon collider in CERN, Switzerland, which also is, is set up with its polarities all in one direction. Um, you, you can't help but ask the question, were they, were they trying to do the same thing? Were they trying to create some type of particle accelerator using um, uh, cosmic or Earth energy? And I, I don't think it's an unreasonable question to ask. And you know, just like uh, we look at this thing and probably scratch our heads and say, what the heck are they trying to do there? I'm sure there were some aspects of the culture in ancient times when these were being constructed that um, people were saying, you know, what are they trying to do? Uh, why are they doing this? And um, I'm not so sure that the reasons were in, in some way similar, just not perhaps in a different context. Um, and if we go back to that location of the Hidden Valley Chamber, uh, we do see that it has an alignment uh, to the southeast with a winter solstice sunrise. And there's a hill right here and a, and a pathway that leads up to it uh, that looks quite old. 
uh, leads right to a notch that was dug out of the hill that the sun would appear through on that uh, winter solstice sunrise morning. So again, I think uh, pretty good evidence that this is purposeful. Um, and, and here is a, a, just a picture of a uh, chamber entrance showing a solstice sunrise to kind of drive home the point. The last site we're going to look at is the, um, the Great Cairns and Serpent Effigies on Overlook Mountain. This is also in my hometown of Woodstock, and I've really been um, uh, putting a lot of energy into, into researching this site. It, it is quite a fascinating site. Overlook Mountain is really a striking uh, mountain. It sits on the very easternmost slopes of the Catskill Mountains. This comes right down into the Hudson Valley. The Hudson River is over here. So it is really uh, the most eastern of the, of the Catskills, um, almost acting as a century. And uh, it has been documented. And I consider it a serial use area because it has been used by many groups over many periods of time uh, for different purposes. And going back to a few thousand years BC, we had Indians using uh, the site um, for preparing their game uh, in winter. And we also had bluestone quarrying that took place there in the uh, uh, mid-19th century. And that took place right up until cement was, was discovered. And then they, um, or maybe I should say rediscovered, because cement's been around a long time. Um, and, then, and then the bluestone industry really died out. Um, so we're going we're gonna to take a look. Um, Overlook Mountain, Karen site is right here sitting at the very bottom of what is historically known as the Wall of the Manitou. This is a geographic feature that sits uh, west of the Hudson River. It's an escarpment, very distinct. It's only breached in, uh, in, in one place towards the middle. This is about 14 miles. And I think it's kind of interesting that this site sits right at the very southern terminus. And this happens to be the Hamanasset Line, which uh, passes very close to it. A little closer view of what we're looking at there, a winter view of Overlook Mountain. This is a chronology of the serial use of the area. Um, I, I'm not going to go through it all, but basically you had, um, you had a lot of people using it for different reasons, subdividing, taking lumber, bluestone quarrying. Uh, there's a nice subdivision up there now, people living there. My first attempt at surveying what was up there, we have uh, two serpent walls up at the 1,500-foot level, snake effigies. We have numerous small cairns, which are these Xs. We have some more large cairns that are between 50 and 100 feet in length. I did go up there with um, a group from the New York State Museum. I convinced uh, them to take a look at it. And uh, Susan Winchell Sweeney, who's their GIS expert, uh, accompanied us. And she um, plotted everything with, with GPS. So we had a survey up there of where everything was located, the large cairns, uh, the serpent effigy walls, the uh, s there are two springs up there that are, that are there uh, eternally. And we have all these numerous uh, smaller cairns, which uh, appear to be in rows and, and almost in clusters. And it was really the large, the six uh, large, there are six large cairns and two serpent effigy walls that I really started ca concentrating on when somebody suggested that I look and see if they um, form any kind of configuration. To me, they were just kind of random. So I started by simply tracing the locations of those and connecting them in the only logical way you could with straight lines. And uh, this is what it looks like on a topographical map on the mountain. If you take those large uh, stone constructions between 50 and 100 feet in length and connect them together. There's a closer look at some of those constructions that make up this, uh, this configuration. One of the serpent effigy walls is here. This is one of the large cairns, another large cairn, another large cairn. Here's their place in the, uh, in the configuration. This is the serpent wall. This would be the, the head of it. I think the mouth has been worked. This is the nose. To me, it's very uh, uh, snake and serpent-like. It's simply a 90-foot curving wall with a large uh, uh, bedrock boulder at the, um, at the head of it. There's a uh, second wall, uh, which is uh, about 300 feet, uh, about 100 yards um, east of the first wall. And it's not in nearly as good a shape. It's been knocked down and, um, you know, I, I've had people say, if, um, if this wall was really quite ancient, how could it be in such good shape? Which is a reasonable question. But there is a mirror image of it with the second wall. I mean, I just think it's lucky that no big trees have fallen over it. For many years, there were very few trees on the mountain because it was denuded of, uh, of all lumber. But when we look at the second one, it's, it's really quite decrepit and has fallen down in, in places and trees have fallen across it. And I think that attests to the age of both of them. One of the large cairns. This is another large cairn. This one uh, 
which is at the lowest elevation on the mountain. When we brought Sherry White, who's the tribal, uh, she's the tribal preservation officer for the uh, Stockbridge Band of the Mohican uh, Muncie, um, and she came here because this site was threatened by a, a cell tower proposed, which was built, but they luckily uh, did not destroy any of the cairns in this site. She, uh, Sherry came out and immediately when she saw this, she thought it could be a burial mound, a Native American burial mound, and she is a, a tribal preservation officer. She believed that if you used um, ground penetrating radar, you could perhaps determine if there is a cyst or a chamber or, or, or something located beneath this. Um, so a very, very fascinating structure. This shows you some of the construction techniques of these large uh, cairns. This is a, a retaining wall built on the downhill slope side to basically keep this, this uh, in place. I believe it was built in a way that it, uh, constructed so it would last a great period of time, which I believe it has. Now, somebody had told me uh, I should look to see if that configuration matches any of the constellations. And I was a bit skeptical, but I figured I have nothing to lose. I might as well look and see. And uh, I mirrored it because I had heard that other petroforms on the ground mirror the, what's in the sky, as is above, so below, is an axiom of uh, many ancient cultures. And right away, Draco jumped right out at me, the snake or serpent uh, constellation, and a uh, northern constellation and a circumpolar constellation. And uh, here is uh, Draco, and here is our configuration on the mountain. And when we turn them to a line, we see, wow, it is a pretty good match. And I've gone here and, and attached uh, or associated some of the stars of Draco with uh, some of the cairns, or maybe we could call them star mounds, associated with this, uh, this um, geoglyph. And here it is, again, viewed from above. Now, um, this is not the only example of Draco being used in construction. Uh, in reading Heaven's Mirror by, by Graham Hancock and his wife, uh, Santa Fia, uh, I found that one of their uh, research associates f discovered that Angkor Wat, the complex of Angkor Wat, which is right here, conforms almost precisely to, uh, to Draco in many ways. So here's another example uh, of, of what I think I've discovered here. And in the United States, we have Herman Bender's Stickman Petroform, discovered in the 90s in southeastern Wisconsin. And this also mirrors the constellations Scorpius and Libra. And uh, it also appears to make a, a stick figure, a human effigy. And also the Serpent Fort, by, uh, re uh, researched by Lee Pennington, he found that this in Georgia uh, also is a representation of, of Draco with uh, Ursa Major and Minor thrown in as well. And we also have um, the Serpent Mound in Ohio, which has been shown to uh, configure uh, quite, lo quite a large section of it configures with, with also the constellation Draco. And um, you know, Draco was a, uh, here's a, a little, I don't know, is it reading? The, this is a, um, using Starry Night Pro, the, the astro astronomy software, if I put in the coordinates of the site on Overlook Mountain, what appears in the sky directly above it is Draco, so we know that Draco rises right above Overlook Mountain um, uh, and has done so for, for actually many thousands of years. So it's, it's quite possible that this mountain was a, a beacon um, showing a celestial north. And this is, again, the configuration on the mountain. And it almost uh, very closely mirrors uh, the position of Draco above, uh, directly above it. Um, so viewed as a uh, geoglyph from above, the Overlook Mountain component petroform mirrors Draco's position above the site coordinates for Overlook Mountain as shown just before sunrise in the Starry Night Pro software screenshot. And I'm hoping that's, that's reading. I can't quite see it from this angle. But, um, and again, uh, these. Um now, we know that. Draco was identified by many ancient cultures across the planet, from the uh, Chinese to the Persians to the Norse. Uh, it was identified as the serpent or, or uh, snake uh, constellation. I would find it surprising if, if Native Americans did not also make this association, uh, although it, it's, um, it has not been well documented. And as a circumpolar constellation, I think this would have been a, a very, very um, important constellation to any early sky watchers who would have wanted to keep track of Celestial North, which is what this um, constellation continually uh, uh, rotates around in the sky. And um, it's also interesting to note, and the, the uh, um, 
the third star in the tail of Draco is Thuban, and Thuban was the pole star for many uh, centuries, uh, 5,000 years ago. In fact, when the Great Pyramids were built, uh, there's a shaft in the King's Chamber that now points to nothing in the sky, but at the time of construction pointed to Thuban, which was the, the pole star at that time. And due to precession, the pole star drifts from its position, and I think, it, uh, it, but, but regardless of the drift of precession, Draco is always spinning around celestial north. So if you wanted to mark where that was, if that was significant to you, and you wanted to make it procession proof, you would watch Draco, and you would see that it is always spinning around the point that is celestial north, wherever that point moves due to, due to um, precession of the equinox. Uh, so um, if we go back into pre-Christian mythology, ancient mythology, we see that the, uh, <coughs> there is an association with the uh, tree of life, uh, with the axis of the earth, uh, with the serpent, um, and the constellation Draco. Uh, this has um, been documented in many cultures ar around the world, pre-Christian, as I say. Uh, and, and, and if you read, uh, if you're interested in researching that a, a little bit more, um, this book, Hamlet's Mill, an essay investigating the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through time by Giorgio Dan, uh, de, Santa, uh, de Santalina and Hertha von Deutschen is a wonderful book that explores the mysteries of all ancient cultures and, and correlates uh, many of the uh, beliefs showing that one of the major preoccupations of, of, native, of uh, ancient cultures worldwide was the procession of the equinox. And, um, and it seemed to have been a, 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 uh, an obsession with preliterate man as, as well documented in this book. So just a few conclusions that we can draw here. Uh, there are many constructions. Uh, of known origins to exist on Overlook Mountain, walls, foundations, quarries, no question about that. And there are also many uh, stone constructions of unknown origin that exist up there. Uh, walls and cairns and these great cairns, and nobody really knows who built them. Um, and the large, uh, large eight lithic constructions together form a serpent effigy uh, covering, whoop, sorry about that, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> They are covering an, an area of about an acre and a half up there, and I believe this was a component petroform, or an earth geoglyph. A uh, component petroform because it's not all one construction, it's spread out over an area, and not all the uh, constructions are contiguous to each other, but when connected, uh, the components do form what I believe is a petroform. And when viewed from above, it, it I believe, is a geoglyph. So uh, does seem to uh, resemble Draco quite closely. Is there a correlation? I believe there is. Uh, it is a circumpolar constellation which always marks celestial north. Um, I believe the mountain has served as a beacon for celestial north for early sky watchers in its view shed and even could be used today. It's still functioning in that way. I see it from my house. I see Draco above the mountain almost every night. So could all this have been an expression of a belief system in place by a culture inhabiting the region or passing through in ancient times uh, making these uh, significant cultural resources? I believe they are. Now. Megaliths in general. This is a, uh, something that we need to um, keep in mind because there may be a very important message associated with these sites. When people visit these sites, they always seem to feel a, a sense of uh, awe and wonderment, and um, as if there's something there, to, a message to be discovered. Um, a, 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 uh, a news item came across my desk a few months ago uh, talking about these megaliths in northeast Japan. And there's a, it turns out there was a whole network of megaliths up and down the, e, the e, northeast coast of Japan for 100 miles, built inland. The last one put in place um, 600 years ago, but they date back thousands of years, and they comprised a warning network, uh, warning of tsunamis, warning of to live in peace and tranquility for generations upon generations. One must heed this warning. Don't build your dwellings beyond this point. And of course, um, this was ignored, and you can't help but ask if this was a, um, you know, a case of uh, of cultural inherency that went awry. You know, should 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 this have been paid attention to all along, and would it have saved many lives um, in recent times? Uh, so th these are um, these are valid and important questions. Now uh, I don't know how I'm, how I'm doing on time. I know I was moving pretty quick, um, but I do want to. Uh, if you haven't had enough of this, up, up in Burlington next weekend, uh, we have a, um, a conference that's going on that uh, kind of continues this theme. Uh, a little more of the academic uh, academics are, are thrown in, but 
academics are beginning to pay attention to all this. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's very important and it's beginning to gain credence in, in the traditional sciences. Um, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna end here by reading a little bit the, the, uh, um, the federal government, the Department of Agriculture and the uh, um, National Forest Service are for the first time currently developing a uh, secret site policy for uh, documenting and identification of lithic sites, of Native American lithic sites. So this is an important uh, event and, and um, because these sites really need to be protected. Currently they really are not afforded the type of protection that they are afforded in um, in England, in, in, in Europe. In Europe these are, you know, uh, everything, um, you know, they realized that there was an ancient culture there before them and everything is in some way based on that. So they, they have um, protected everything that's ancient. Here, uh, not so much, and, the, and they really need to, and it's good that they're, they're beginning to pay attention to this because these sites need protection, and um, we really need to take responsibility, each one of us, ourselves, when we visit these sites, to, to be responsible and to um, uh, keep them from, from uh, changing. I always say, uh, don't change the site, let the site change you. And I think that's a, a, a good way to look at it. So I, I did submit, um, do, do I, am I doing on time? Hugh or? About 10 minutes. Okay, great. Um, I'm just basically going to, uh, the, the uh, sacred site policy was um, open to input from public uh, people who had a, an interest up until September 15th. So I did, I did prepare something and send it in and I just want to share it with everyone because uh, I believe that the key to finding out um, Excuse me. <laughs> Informing a sacred sites policy, I think it's important for the Forest Service and Department of Agriculture to expand its current concept of sacred places uh, and of uh, Native American cultural contributions to recognize, embrace, better understand the complex nature uh, and level of sophistication and social stu structure attained by archaic and early woodland humans in the Northeast. This complex culture and its uh, people existed and developed for many centuries, extending all over the northeast coastline and occupying the inland woodlands, living along the lakes and waterways of our region. In considering this, we must also recognize that this is a continuing and currently living culture with deep roots dating back over 10,000 years. So evidence of this complexity must be considered when examining sacred sites associated with the belief system of these ancient inhabitants of the northeast U.S. Also must be considered that prior um, to what Alfred Crosby coined as the Columbian Exchange, leading to the near extinction of the North American indigenous population, some believe between 70 and 90 percent, in perhaps as little as 150 years. Uh, and it's interesting, most uh, recent population estimates prior to contact are now between 40 and 60 million, going up all the time, uh, and uh, double from, decade, from a decade ago. Many experts think that there may have been 100 million people living in this co country before or on this continent prior to, uh, to contact. Um, <clears throat> and that this continent's landscapes had already been mastered in every way by the native population. Uh, Charles Mann in his book, 1491, New Revelations About the Americas Before Columbus, documents how uh, among the native population, generation after generation of indigenous surveyors systematically explored, identified, named, uh, manipulated, exploited most every aspect of the natural world to their benefit, both practically and spiritually. So to not give the Northeast Native indigenous culture credit for accomplishing all the hallmark practices of other North and South American civilizations uh, that they have been credited with does, again, a huge disservice, greatly underselling the abilities of these highly intelligent, industrious, and in, in, ingenious people. Uh, most important of these practices is represented in many lithic monument uh, sacred sites in the Northeast and worldwide is the relationship with, between the ground, uh, the sky, uh, and the horizon. So when identifying and documenting potential sacred and ceremonial sites, relationships between these features, uh, the features such as stone walls and rows, rows of standing stones or boulders, piles of stones in rows, and other constructions which have possible alignments uh, with events on the horizon, such as the position of the sun on the longest and shortest days of the year, um, as well as the sunrise and sunset on the days of equal night and day, the, the uh, vernal and autumnal equinox, uh, this should be examined as artifacts and considered evidence uh, as significant cultural resources. And one of the problems with these sites is that they are not, um, there are no excavations, there are no artifacts that are associated with them. Um, 
So, so uh, and, and I believe because they, they just haven't stood up to, to the type of weather and the type of environment we have in the Northeast, which is not like the Southeast or not like Egypt where, where artifacts last for, you know, 10,000 years. Um, <clears throat> so the presence of such lithic features and functions speaks to the high intelligence, complex nature of the belief system associated with those who constructed and utilized the sites. Uh, given the uh, ancient Northeast native population credit for being attentive sky watchers who marked what they observed in stone and other landscape monuments should be a cornerstone of any federal agency policy relating to identifying, documenting, and protecting significant cultural resources. Uh, to that end, establishing a calendar of relevant dates and relative uh, alignments and angles um, for a given latitude and declination would assist in identification, documentation, measurement, verification of potential alignments uh, as site features and functions associated with ceremonial practices and beliefs. Uh, additionally, uh, as this is addressed, uh, appropriate language and terminology should be developed and included in the sacred sites document, uh, including definitions and descriptions of specific sacred site features and functions re re relating to astronomic alignments and other site configurations and features. Uh, Dr. Andrew Guilford, who in 1994 studied and documented Native American sacred sites, detailed some styles which include sites associated with traditions and origin stories, trails and pilgrimage routes, traditional gathering areas, offering areas, shrines and altars, vision quest and indi individual site uh, use sites, uh, group ceremonial sites including sweat lodges, uh, singing and chanting sites, uh, ancestral habitation areas, uh, battle, burial, and massacre sites, uh, sites of petroglyphs and pictroglyphs, and of course observation and calendar sites. And it also may be of interest to consider that this is a time of discovery for us, and in many cases a uh, time of rediscovery for the tribes uh, as to the specific meaning, purpose, and practice associated with any particular <coughs> site. So until these sites are more fully understood and attain a status of protection, they deserve uh, no one group or, should, or monopoly should be deciding uh, what is or isn't appropriate spiritual activity at a sacred site. Uh, if these sites are truly to be regarded as sacred places, i.e. Uh, uh, temples or, or places of worship, um, then we must consider uh, them as open houses of worship and given them all the respect and accordance and associated with other such places. Uh, if sites are identified as uh, funerary sites, memorial or other sites where votive offerings uh, were an homage were paid um, and may still be paid, uh, then the sanctity of the site should remain intact. Um, in regards to keeping sacred sites once identified safe and secure from theft or vandalism, public knowledge of a specific location of sites should be closely restricted. Uh, however, the uh, National Forest Service should cooperate, assist, and coordinate with tribes to create a comprehensive national database <laughs> of sacred sites identified and located on national forest lands. Best practices site database should be um, with, uh, should include precise uh, coordinates for the locations as well as a list of all relevant site features and functions and artifacts associated um, as identified and confirmed through research, proper research. Uh, this value, valuable tool will assist uh, the federal and tribal authorities in plotting, mapping, sorting, filtering, tracking, monitoring sites uh, uh, assess conditions, help determine if and when site impact, theft, or vandalism has occurred over time. So it's an important goal in crafting a sacred sites policy should be raising the importance of establishing the nature, meaning, and true ownership of these sites in the public consciousness. Through this process, we can make identifying and protecting Native American sacred sites uh, be more seen as a public interest instead of a special interest, as it's currently perceived. So these concepts speak to the importance of cultural inheritance. Um, understanding these sites, uh, these silent, understanding these silent sacred sites may hold an important key to correcting many of the imbalances we experience in today's world. For many, being in their presence offers a calming, healing, parasympathetic energy, which seems to nourish and lift the human spirit in some way that we have yet to fully grasp, but we're beginning to study and examine in both medical and scientific terms. By identifying, studying, protecting, and better understanding all we can about these sites, the better for it, for all of us it will be. Um, so, and I should just end with the point that there is no uh, state land, um, state park, state monument, national monument that 
doesn't sit on what was once ancestral lands of the native population. So uh, for that, I thank you, and um, that's it. And, and some chambers that we're going to uh, take a look at. And as I said, we can't really look at all of them because it would take too long, but kind of uh, this will be a tour of um, some of my favorite sites that I've been uh, researching. We're going to start with uh, the Mink Hollow Karen Fields in Lake Hill, New York, and they are located right on the Ulster Green County line. The site consists of two separate Karen complexes, each uh, with a few dozen low circular Karens, about two meters across and one meter high, very uniform, scattered over a sloping area of upland forest just north of the headwaters of the Beaver, uh, Beaver Kill Creek. And uh, we'll see a lot of these sites are associated with uh, headwaters of, of um, tributaries to major rivers and also sp um, natural spring locations. So there are cairns here and stone walls, and um, uh, this is a, a location of where it is in Lake Hill, right here near the Ulster Green County line in the town of Woodstock, which is my hometown. A near member named Don Rue, an elderly, very tall gentleman uh, who I met at an early New York conference, gave me a map of Mink Hollow when he heard I had re been researching there. And this is the map he created of the Karen Fields and the, and the stone walls up there. And after several trips up into Mink Hollow, eventually I did find everything on this map. And it was, it was quite interesting to see how it lined up with some of the things that I had done. This was an early drawing I had done of the Mink Hollow uh, Karen Field and, and one of the walls there that runs about 250 feet and then has a bend in it. And this is a cross section of this wall. Uh, you'll see pictures of it. It's straight up on one side and sloping down in, on, on the opposite side. And the land actually comes right up to the top here. Uh, so it's kind of uh, a, a little bit unusual. We're going to start looking at some of the pictures of the Cairns. And you know, there's a lot of them. And um, to some, they're just piles of stone. Uh, and to me, they're a little more interesting than that. And you, they seem to be in rows. They seem to um, be very well formed, very purposeful, uh, which is which is um, typical of, of Karens that are built as part of a of a um, belief system. And I think it's also um, important to mention that while these sites currently kind of fall between the cracks of archaeology and anthropology, uh, they are beginning to get noticed. And um, there is a site in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. Uh, the airport there was looking to extend its runway. And at the end of the runway were some stone walls and some uh, uh, stone mounds, probably similar to this. There's a stone wall that leads to a, a, a large boulder with a pile of uh, stones stacked upon it, perhaps a, a serpent or snake effigy. Uh, and the Turner's Falls site, um, you know, colonial stone walls and constructions are pretty much a dime a dozen in the Northeast. Everybody just assumes everything is that. But what made the Turner's Falls site a little bit different was that the Native American tribes themselves came forward when they saw that the site was endangered by the construction project on the runway. And they really, um, I guess, decided amongst themselves to share with the uh, people who were about to destroy the site that it was something very uh, special to them and sacred and ceremonial. And that is the first site. Uh, and because the, uh, the tribal preservation officers, I believe it was the Narragansett um, and, and um, Mashapee and the Wampanoag tribes, and Doug Harris, who was one of the tribal preservation officers, who brought this to the attention of the authorities and said, no, these are our constructions, and we, we do uh, want them protected, 
uh, got them li listed and, and protected, and they are the first sites in the Northeast that are um, considered to be uh, and recognized uh, by the um, uh, federal government as a Native American lithic ceremonial sacred site in the Northeast. So that really set a precedent and in some way opened the door for looking at what these other sites might be and if they fall into the same category. Uh, so, again, we're looking at a wall here that um, seems to point to a, a low spot in the, um, on the, on the uh, horizon there. And if we were to put our, our compass on that, I'm not sure if I have a compass shot of that one, but it, it is pointing towards the southeast where the winter uh, solstice sun would probably appear coming over that mountain on the shortest day of the year, December 21st. There's another view of one of the walls up there quite tall on this side, sloping down on that side. This is actually the land that rises right up to the top of the wall. Um, quite, quite unusual. Here you can see it. And, and you, don't, you don't typically see walls like this. Here's a, a portion of the wall that's running dead north-south. And you know, looking in the, uh, in the historical records, you don't find any uh, land boundaries or, or um, sur uh, We're going to uh, talk about some of the lost landscapes and the hidden legacy in the Northeast backwoods. And we're going to look at some sites uh, that are cairns and, and chambers, megaliths, um, and some effigies. And um, I, I uh, read the book Manitou many years ago. It was published in 1989 by James Maver and Byron Dix. And these guys did a, went a long ways towards um, proving that the natives in the Northeast did in fact build in stone and in many cases um, aligned their constructions with uh, astronomical events on the horizon. And um, they, they, they were no lightweights. Uh, Byron Dix was an uh, optical engineer, an optics engineer, and James Maver was uh, a naval architect at Woods Hole and uh, was one of the co-developers of the Alvin Submersible Submarine, and he also was involved with the uh, excavations in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean of Saturini in the late 60s uh, that was associated with uh, Atlantis. And I had bought a, a copy of Ign Ignatius Donnelly's uh, book, uh, Atlantis, and lucky, luckily enough, inside the front cover were some original articles from the 1967 New York Times article on the find. And there's uh, a Maver uh, pictured um, uh, it, directing the excavations in the Mediterranean on uh, Saturnini. So um, these guys really had, had a lot um, to do with kind of, I, I, I would say a lot of my research is built on theirs. And the case is still trying to be made that the natives did do this. It's not, um, it, it's really not taken for granted that the Native Americans in the Northeast built, built in stone or did astronomical observation, even though it is taken for granted in almost every other part of America, Central, uh, the Southwest, the uh, certainly South American ancient cultures all had a tradition of doing this. And it's really selling the Northeast native civilization short to say that they did not. Um, so I, I started looking at sites and investigating sites uh, similar to the ones that uh, uh, Byron Dix and James Maver did in New England uh, here in the Hudson Valley and found um, what I believe to be quite a few sites that fall into the category that possibly could be Native American. Um, and I made a, a database of these sites uh, so you could sort them and filter them and look for certain uh, patterns, concentrations, distributions that help, help us understand. And these are the names of some of the sites. We're not going to be able to look at them all today. We have seven Karen sites. I think it's kind of interesting to note that the Karen sites um, fall more in the, in the mountains uh, and the um, uh, Perched rocks and standing stoles and dolmens uh, usually are on ridge tops or mountain tops, higher locations. Uh, and then we also have alignment.